Yeah, Kevin, go ahead, please. All right. So for those that you, for those of you who don't know, I'm also, uh, I'm a co-founder. Uh, myself and Neil started every Black Life Matters EBLM. So, um, so we're here together and we're honored to have Clarence Henderson here. You hear more about him and his story here is forthcoming. But for this Black History Month, it was important for us to really bring out as much as we can about uh, notable um, people in history who, who made a significant um, accomplishment or who endured uh, an accomplishment that we can all sort of celebrate. And uh, Mr. Henderson is just the epitome of a humble servant and a, uh, a modern day uh, civil rights uh, icon, in my opinion. And I hold him, he's a great friend, but I hold him with high esteem as well uh, because of the man that he is. It's not just what he endured in the, in the 60s and 70s, but it's his life. And uh, hopefully you get a sense of that as we go through this. I'm gonna start with a prayer. If you don't mind, bow with me. Father, we're just thankful and grateful that you've given us an opportunity to come together as, um, as family, friends, and partners, and, and uh, uh, donors, and contributors. And we just thank you that uh, you brought us here together, that we would be able to uh, glean from history and, and learn uh, let some life lessons and some important uh, ideas, precepts, and uh, things that, that uh, Clarence Henderson, uh, your sovereign, has, uh, has been able to participate in over the years. We're thankful for his life, that you've given him the uh, opportunity to uh, be a good example and representative for you and for your kingdom uh, through all of the things that he's uh, been able to accomplish and have gone through. We just ask that you would bless this time together, bless uh, each and every participant in their households, and uh, just allow us, Lord, that we would be able to uh, leave from this meeting then refreshed and renewed uh, with, a, with a new desire, ambition, and, and goal of being all that you want and need us to be uh, just by virtue of what we hear from Clarence Anderson. So, Father, we thank you for it all. We lay it all at your feet right now. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So with that, I guess, uh, let's see, Lonnie Neil. or Neil. Uh, Neil, why don't you go ahead, Neil? I'm going to have to unmute. Hi, so my name is Neil Momin. I'm uh, one of the co-founders, as Kevin said. And uh, my background, since uh, most of you probably do know, if you've heard of a different co conference, uh, heard us on different events before, I was actually born in Africa born in Ghana, grew up in Ethiopia, Jamaica, Sudan, Yemen, and, uh, and India. So uh, African by culture, Indian by heritage, uh, by, by ethnicity, and came to the States when I was, uh, when I came here to go to college. So uh, just gives you a brief kind of background of where I'm at. I uh, am an engineer in Silicon Valley, and Kevin and I have a lot of similarity in our IT and engineering background. So uh, I'm a ordained preacher, with Relentless Community Church, and I'm also um, uh, the president of the Values Advocacy Council out here in San Jose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, I'm reminded, of, but only just reminded our, our viewership that uh, um, we often tease Neil as being the only true African-American because he was actually born in Africa <laughs> and, and he is an American citizen. So uh, thank you so much for that, Neil. My name is Lonnie Poindexter and um, I'm the, the newest recruit to the uh, to EBLM and I'm uh, excited to be a part of this uh, magnificent ministry that uh, Neil and, and Kevin have, have put together and um, along with uh, Regina and um, it's truly an honor and a pleasure to be associated with. We're on the front lines fighting a good fight of faith. And the individual that we're going to be uh, uh, talking with today and he's gonna be sharing with us is uh, an iconic figure um, and a true pioneer um, in, within those who have our worldview. And uh, let me share a little bit uh, about his back. I'm gonna read directly from his bio and then um, I'm gonna share with you my thoughts having met him. In 1960, on the second day of the Greensboro sit-in, Joseph A. McNeil and Franklin E. McCain are joined by William Smith and Clarence Henderson 
at the Woolworth Lunch Counter in Greensboro, North Carolina. Clarence Henderson was in the forefront of the civil rights battle as he bravely stepped up to participate in the sit-in at the Woolworth's Diner. Today, Mr. Henderson is a champion for freedom and conservative values. His message will inspire you and teach you how to change the narrative in this nation. From liberty for a few to liberty for all. In 2000, Mr. Henderson was the recipient of the 40th anniversary sit-in participant award. And in 2013, he was appointed by Governor Pat McCrory to the chairman seat on the North Carolina Martin Luther King Jr. Commission. In addition, Governor McCrory conferred in 2016 the Order of the Longleaf Pine Award to Clarence with the rank of Ambassador Extraordinary. Mr. Henderson was appointed president of the Frederick Douglass Foundation for the state of North Carolina in May 2017, of which he currently serves. He also served since November 2019 on the advisory board of the Black Voices for Trump. Mr. Henderson's energetic involvement in his church as head elder, new members coordinator, Sunday school teacher, and finance committee member, and his life's journey as a teacher, college administrator, entrepreneur, and motivational speaker has given him a unique perspective on what confronts society today. While his life is chronicled with episodes of civil unrest in which he found himself thrust in the midst, he did his part to bring awareness and change in a peaceful manner. Clarence is now champions a new cause for a better America by challenging, motivating, and inspiring others to be aware and responsible for the world that surrounds them. That's powerful. And there's a lot more that can be added, but we'd be talking for a half hour just about his bio. Um, but I just would say that in my opinion, um, he's an iconic figure and having a good pleasure to meet him. And I, I, I tell you, it, it humbled me. And I'll, I'll say this, when you lay down your life and you say, here I am, Lord, use me as you see fit. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say, and I'll do what you want me to do. The most amazing things happen. I left life in the high technology industry. God got my attention. And when I said, okay, I cried uncle and said, okay, he dropped me right in the middle of being around some of the most phenomenal people I would ever imagine I would have the opportunity to meet. Clarence Anderson is certainly one of those individuals, along with many others that, that are in his inner circle of those who champion the cause to stand up against insurmountable odds, yet they had the courage to do so and God moved in and through them. And it's truly an honor and a pleasure. I interviewed him in Texas and also in Washington, D.C., was able to participate with him with many things across the nation. So I'm just truly humbled, sir, that you would join us this evening. Thank you so much, Lonnie. It's a pleasure uh, again to have a, an opportunity to have a conversation with you. And I just want to share with people that all the things that I have done that are good things, I don't take credit for it. It's all God. I have just had the courage to answer when I've been called. And so that's the first thing I would say to anybody on this uh, call is that God has a reason for all of us being here now. And if you don't know what that reason is, you need to go and ask him and he will tell you. Um, I got started on this journey, uh, physical journey, when I was 18 years of age. The spiritual journey started for me when uh, I was uh, born, I believed in uh, divine intervention. And my father was a sharecropper in uh, a little place called Townville, South Carolina. And he did something that was very interesting when he came to naming me. The guy that he worked for was, was white, became his best friend, and he named me after that guy. And it mm -hmm. set, helped set the tone for me to bridge the gap between the races. And I've always been involved in the middle of this. I've been sort of like Jonah. Even when I ran away from it, it always has caught up with me. And so uh, I'm just here now to pass the torch of liberty to the coming generations so that they understand the price that has been made, been paid 
for especially for a people whose history has not been told as it should have been told and uh, probably will never be told as it should be told. So I'm here just to share with you from my point of view, uh, what I've gone through and what I think we need to do at this particular point in time. I think you hit the nail on the head, sir. Our history is not being told as it should be our true history. Our history depicted today, uh, at least the mainstream media and then the, those with a left side of the world worldview is uh, one of victimhood and victimization instead of one of overcoming. And our true story is about how, regardless of the obstacles put within our path, because of God and God's help, we prevailed and excelled. And I equate it to much like uh, if, if you're into sports and, and are keeping yourself fit and you work out with weights and you do weight training and weight is resistance and resistance and weight pushes back. You have to push against the weight to conquer the weight. And the byproduct of that is you build muscle. And I see us as a people in this nation is the weight that was put on us was the weight of how we got here and what we were subjected to. But because of us pushing back on that weight, we excelled and became what we're known throughout the world today is those who overcome in the most amazing stories, your particular story, iconic figures throughout history um, with black Americans and how we overcame in spite of, and we must tell the true history if we want to bring about the change that we seek and I'm so happy that you continue to do that. And what you do is you embolden myself, Kevin, Neil, and Regina, and all of the uh, um, those that are listening in and, and watching in on the uh, the program today to do exactly that. Can you share with our listeners a little bit about um, uh, your background? You know, I, I, where you come from, where you were born, and um, family life. Yes, uh, I was born in a little place called Townville, South Carolina. I don't have a birth certificate, but uh, God has made sure that I've been made known. And so uh, uh, I can remember trying to help my mother pick cotton in the cotton fields in, in South Carolina. And uh, it just shows that it's not where you come from, it's where you're going. And it shows not what's behind you, uh, in front of you, but it's what's in you. So we moved to Greensboro when I was about uh, uh, six years of age, I think it was. And of course, during that time, it was uh, the time of segregation. That's the time that I grew up in, which they said was separate but equal. And my question always has been, if we are equal, why should we be separate? But we moved into an all black neighborhood where you had all classes of people, if you will, from professionals to uh, common workers, uh, and uh, obviously when you move in, especially for guys, when you move, during that time, you move into a new neighborhood, you're always challenged by some of the other guys. And so my first uh, uh, thing that I un understood to deal with was uh, the physical side. That I, because when I grew up, I almost had, had to fight almost every day uh, mm -hmm. when I moved, we moved to Greensboro. And um, so that not, that's not what makes me spiritually strong uh, as I am at this particular point in time. And when we moved into that neighborhood, uh, one of the things I'll share is that uh, that kind of neighborhood uh, is the same kind of neighborhood we live in right now, a lot of us. And what, what do I mean by that? The Indian is on reservations. A lot of Blacks are on reservations right now. It's called Harlem, it's called Chicago, it's called Detroit. And what goes on in those neighborhoods are, uh, they, a lot of things go in those neighborhoods that you cannot do in other neighborhoods. And so when we came to Greensboro, after living there for uh, where we lived in the, in the black neighborhood um, for about two years, the third year is what really changed my life as far as the outlook. And we moved into, believe it or not, what they would call now a, 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 an integrated neighborhood. Uh, we live in a cul-de-sac cul behind where all uh, our neighbor, neighbors are white, right near uh, in walking distance of uh, UNCG, which is at that time was Women's College. And so uh, even though we had moved into that neighborhood uh, and were surrounded by a lot of other schools, they still bust me back to the neighborhood where I was originally uh, living in. 
And so I've been blessed all my life. I, uh, as far as education is concerned, I have never been to an integrated school. But what happened by riding the bus, I had a chance to see outside of the neighborhood that I grew up in. And so I began to understand that there was a different world than the one that I lived in. And so growing up, uh, I can remember my mother taking me to, uh, we go downtown and we go into Woolworths and I used to see uh, two water fountains, one saying color, one saying white. And I used to wonder what was the difference because the water looked the same. And I also had uh, two uh, uh, bathrooms, one saying color, one saying white. And upstairs you had the lunch counter, which I'm sure we'll talk about later on. But uh, I, I, I grew up initially in the uh, probably the worst city, uh, worst neighborhood or worst community in all of Greensboro. And so a lot of people ask me when I sit at that lunch counter, was I fearful? The answer is no, because I've been through some tougher things uh, in that old neighborhood. So God prepared me uh, for what uh, he had in store for me. And I'm very thankful to have had the opportunity to participate in the city and move in Greensboro. Mm. That's a powerful statement right there. God prepared you. So mm -hmm. through the obstacles, you're prepared for a, a greater battle and a greater victory. That's amazing to hear. I was curious as to uh, how you were stemmed up and prepared to do the courageous things that you and your peers did and sitting at that lunch counter. But, uh, but I get it now. <laughs> he said you hadn't seen nothing yet. Uh, they hadn't showed you anything yet based on what you had already gone through. Yeah, uh, and I've gone through that all my life, and uh, I've always been called out uh, to participate because uh, after the, the, the sit-in movement, I decided that I was going to leave Greensboro and never come back. I was going to the Big Apple, and I did go to the Big Apple, but uh, even while I was at the Big Apple, a funny thing occurred when I was there. There was a ride that, not, uh, a, a uh, ride that broke out when I was there, so right in the middle of Harlem, Harlem, this thing was happening again. And so uh, even when I uh, uh, was called into the military and went down to, when I was at Fort Rucker, Alabama, there was a, uh, uh, a movement in, down in uh, uh, Alabama uh, Mobile, I think it was. And uh, some of us were on standby to go down there. Now I'm on the opposite side of the, uh, of the equation because now we're gonna go down there and try to stop the civil rights movement by order of the United States Army. So again, I've always been in the middle of that. And again, when I got out of the military and came back and went back to a and I don't know if any of you remember, but in 1969, uh, there was a riot that broke out on campus. And so again, I always tell people, you have to be careful when you're around me because something might break out. <laughs> uh, so I'm here today to help pass the torch of liberty to the coming generations because far too many people have cut their teeth on the confidence of security and far too few have cut their teeth on uh, the true grit of courage that is required for freedom's sake. And yes. those of us that have gone through uh, need to reach back and share with people what we've gone through to carry them over because uh, uh, we have been called uh, the wrong thing. Now, like you said earlier, it was almost like you were giving a part of what I was gonna share is that We've been called uh, uh, victims and survivors. We are not that. We are a strong, competitive uh, people. We proved that by coming up out of slavery. And a lot of people don't know what it looked like uh, uh, as far as slavery is concerned. You go back and look at the history, history of it. And we just, I just saw uh, something published on Facebook where it showed us that we were in prone positions, uh, tied together, uh, couldn't even stand up. And yet we came through that came up out of slavery and up out of Jim Crow. So we are a resilient people. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. there are a lot of us that don't realize that, but if we would, then we would, if we realize that, then we would understand that uh, we are just as competitive as anybody else. Amen. Amen. That was straight preach there. Amen. And we are, we are victors, not victims. We may have been victimized, but we are victors and our history in this nation speaks to this. I'm reminded of, uh, the um, I don't have the stat right in front of me, but it's something to affect. I, I bet Kevin or or or, or Neil know it. Uh, but uh, the stat that showed that once emancipation took place and Reconstruction took place, we went from being a predominantly illiterate people to a predominantly literate people, and we did it in half a generation. 
that's never been done in the history of the world. We did that here in this nation. So it just proves that uh, um, a strong, resilient people with a faith in God, um, there's no mountain that they can't conquer. Well, you know, you uh, uh, what you're stating proves that, and that's a part of the history that our people need to understand. And so it started with the foundation of prayer. And mm -hmm. any, any movement that goes on in America, in the world, if we don't have God in the midst of it, it's not going to last. That's one of the things that happened with the civil rights movement I participated in was uh, after we were sitting at the table, we got up and walked away. And unlike the Israelites, we walked away with nothing mm -hmm. because it was a two-part movement. The first part was social. The second part was economic empowerment, which is the new civil rights movement. And we have yet to uh, <coughs> overcome that. <coughs> uh, and the reason for that is because we don't understand how Amer America works. And we would uh, just step in and take the challenge and put America off us and we, we, we could change things overnight because uh, what we went from is that we went from competing to comparing. So when you change the rate of exchange, you change the, you, you change the exchange rate. And so now we're letting other people tell us who we are, what we can do, and we're actually, actually being indoctrinated instead of being educated because we want to look at uh, too many novelties on TV or whatever instead of studying the history of America because if you're a citizen in this country and you don't know the history of this country, you're a citizen in name only. And that's why it's so easily happening that people are rewriting history right now. A lot of times taking us out of the equation. Uh, we're talking about something that's not the most important thing in America, we're all talking about racism. Well, racism would take care of itself if we would just go out here and compete rather than compare and bring uh, uh, our resources to the table and we change things. And so we've got to go back to that uh, kind of situation of uh, competing in order that we take our rightful place. And then a couple of those examples of that is that I know you guys don't you remember to talk about the master race with Germany. Well, Jesse, mm -hmm. Jesse Owens went over there and, and destroyed that whole thing because he was he got, got the chance to compete and he showed that he was just as good from an athletic point of view as anybody else. Another part of that that they don't know about is the person that came in second was Jackie Robinson's brother, who had, uh -huh. had no training as far as uh, 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 participating in the Olympics, had uh, shoes or not the right shoes, even broke records, but uh, and then he wound up coming back to America uh, being a sanitation worker. So those are the kinds of things that I, 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 that history needs to be told. And it, it, it requires more than the one month of, of Black history it requires that it's told every year about the things that we have done. Uh, and uh, I, I liken us to the Israelite people. When God looked down and saw them oppressed, he said, uh, I will make you my people and anything short of heaven and earth will belong to you. But what happened with them is they started to emulate their oppressors. Mm -hmm. When we came to this country, we've done the same thing because everything we put our hands to when we were given an opportunity, it showed that we, we would compete. We could compete. And we need to go back to that now and stop thinking in, in, uh, along the lines of what uh, we can and cannot do. I think one of the biggest things that happened as far as integra integration is concerned that has been detrimental to us is that we either consciously or subconsciously try to integrate into another race of people as opposed to integrate into American free market capitalist system because that Ooh. system doesn't care who owns it. You can actually fail your way to success. And once we understand that is that uh, the greatest thing, that, uh, one of the greatest things America offers is the American opportunity. Uh, yes. I spent almost 40 years uh, 30 years rather been in business for myself uh, and I'm not known for that but uh, that was uh, that taught me about how America works and I try to teach that to people right now about conduct about financial literacy about what is required for you to be able to compete in this country that's powerful that's powerful I'm jumping up and down on the inside on everything that you're, you're stating um, because the economic prowess is um, what gives you the, the 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 power to affect change. You see that if you if you think and um, as you mentioned the uh, uh, Jewish people and and, uh, and and what they the Jews went through and what have you, but their economic prowess allowed them to endure 
whatever they were up against, because you know they were people driven out of their whole nation and driven all over the world, just as scripture points out, but yet through the application of uh, economic prowess, um, they were over to overcome and um, you know, their piece of the pie, if you will. You see that with other ethnicities as well. And, and, and it, if I'd be so bold as to say, I believe that existed with us, but something happened, you know, something happened in the mid 1960s and um, we seem to have lost our way in a former fashion, not discounting uh, the persecution, oppression that we were dealing with as second class citizens, but um, we begin to lose our way. I grew up in a community that was full of entrepreneurs. In fact, if you happen to have the darker paint job, you had to have a side hustle. You had your regular job and then you had what you did on top of that. And that was the one that was supposed to take you over. And then, so it was a lot of entrepreneurs in uh, the neighborhood where I grew in. We had, I had everything, the garbage men um, that lived next door to me, which is like, a, 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 he was a prominent figure in my life. He was an entrepreneur um, to pharmacists, to veterinarians and uh, civil and city workers and everything in between, but they all understood that. But I don't see that a lot today within the current generations. And I think it's because of what's taking place in the media, um, which is you know putting forth false history as we talked about earlier. Well, Lonnie, <clears throat> some amazing things have happened. Uh, and I'll, I'll go back on as far as you just talked about, and that's in the 1960s. During that time, there were 20 million Blacks in America. Since that time, we have had 20 million abortions in, in, the, in the Black community. Yep. And where are all those uh, talents gone? They're over in the graveyard, uh, never to be utilized. And so we need to remember, again, when we talk about race, race is not the concern. I hear so many people talking about, um, uh, 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 talking about the KKK and the Nazis. Well, the KKK and the Nazis don't have to do anything because we're doing it to ourselves. You look at the, the murder rate over in the, in, the, in the Black communities, and we have lost our value as far as life is concerned, and we need to go back and retain that. We need to go back and understand that uh, we're no longer growing as a society, and our race is gradually disappearing. And so, again, what I want to do is make people aware of uh, who we are as a people. And one of the things that you spoke about a little earlier is that stop letting other people tell us who we are. If we want to know who we are, go ask God and he'll tell you. You may not like what he tells you, but he'll tell you that's a starting point. And I tell people all the time that when you look in the mirror, you don't know what you look like because you're looking from the outside in. God looks from the inside out. And so if we understand that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, when we concern this thing, when we get concerned about the melon or the flesh, there's no good thing found in the flesh. So we're wasting our time trying to kind of prove to somebody uh, who we are. And when we go trying to tell people that Black Lives Matter, that's a waste of time. We already know that. We already are aware that when you look at the historic things that we've done from sports to uh, entrepreneurship or whatever, we've seen the greatness of uh, who we are. And so we have to get back to. Uh, believing who we are. And when we start to do that, anything, as I said before, short of heaven and earth will belong to us. Amen. Amen. Um, amen. <laughs> Double amen. Triple amen. Um, something that I remember I learned when I interviewed you in Texas um, and learned more about your story um, is I learned about uh, your character and how your character was demonstrated and what you were put up against. And this is over and above um, racial things and, you know, the second class citizenship for us as a nation and what have you. And it had to deal with because of your values uh, that you shared, and which were conservative. And as I remember you saying, they came from your father. Um, now, for those who may not know this, this gentleman is one of the Greensboro um, boys. Uh, I think the term they used was Greensboro four. There was actually more than four Greensboro boys and they used to go to that lunch counter in shifts if I remember correctly. Right. And so the iconic photo that was taken, um, the one that initially went throughout the newspapers, um, you were not included in that photo. Other photos you were, but not that photo. So from that, and then going forward because of your, your views, because of the views that you shared, 
they started to push back on you. And that's in the community that looks like you. And you had to take a valiant stand. I remember you told me, you said, I can get very vocal about this and jump up and down and scream and say, I'm a Greensboro boy. But you told me, he says, I prayed and I told God that he could, if he would fix it. And he did that. And I'm just share a little bit with our, our listeners how, um, how you came to that point. Did you learn those principles from your father? I certainly did because one of the things that, uh, and all kinds of things I could share with you, but for the sake of time, one of the greatest things that's happened to me is that I grew up in a two parent home. Ah. Uh, that uh, my parents were married. Uh, there was uh, five of us all together at uh, two brothers and, and uh, my mother and father, I'm the only one that's left. So I have to continue to tell that story. Now my father only had a third grade education. But when he moved from the farm and stopped farming, he came to Greensboro and he never worked for anybody but himself. He had uh, this gift that God had given him. He was a mechanic. And during that time, before he had all the bells and whistles, if he heard it run, he could tell you what was wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I should see car, car dealerships in Greensboro bring cars to him that their guys who had the piece of paper on the wall, the certificate, could not repair. And so he had this gift that, uh, uh, that he maximized and he worked six days a week, never heard him curse, never, he never smoked, uh, went to, uh, worked six days a week, went to church uh, and uh, never drank any alcohol. And uh, he, there was never any discussion in our family about white or black. My father was so busy taking care of his family because as I said, he worked six days a week. My mother only worked a part-time job and she only went to work when I started school because I was the youngest and that gave her an opportunity to, to help contribute. And so those are the kind of things that I remember. And I remember back in, um, I think it was sometime in the seventies when I was sitting at the table with him and we never talked politics. And all of a sudden I brought up this conversation about uh, uh, the difference between the, the, the uh, two, uh, uh, part, between the Democrats and Republicans and I started spousing on my dad to my dad about the Democratic part of this and the Democratic part of that. And he sat there very sat there very patiently, listening to me talk. And all of a sudden he said, son, you don't know your history. He said, You don't know what the uh, Republican Party has done for us as a race of people. And I sat there and listened. And here's what I thought was very key: is that I looked at him and I was very respectful and I never said anything, but I thought about daddy. You got a third grade education. I got a college degree and I'm not gonna listen to what you said. And that cost me very mm -hmm. dearly because it was some 25 years plus before I went and did my own research and started to look at what uh, the Republican party had, did, had done. And I started to compare it with the, the Democratic party about the authors of the 13th, 14th, 15th amendment, who was the Republican party. Uh, and the fact that uh, uh, how they operated, whereby the Democratic Party would come to the black neighborhood and they would bring, uh, they would bring a, a, a fish and say, I'll be back tomorrow and I'll give you another fish. But here's what makes the Republican Party different. They would come to our neighborhood with a fish and a fishing pole and take you down mm -hmm. the bank and say, I'll teach you how to fish in case I don't get back tomorrow. So if you need more than one fish, you're able to go and, and, and do it yourself so you can become a self-contained unit. And so when I look at politics, all it is is a system. And if we don't, if you don't master that system, it will master you. Because before there was politics, it was people, before there were people that was God, if we don't understand the order, then we're totally confused. And so we have to go back and look at what God said was versus what man says and who wins out each and every time. And so the opportunity that we have in America is so great. And if you don't understand the, the, our Charles of Freedom, our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, then you're totally lost. Because uh, Ronald Reagan said the nine worst words you can hear is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So we find that, that we keep looking to the government and, and actually what has happened is that for a lot of uh, people in our, that have got caught up in the system, and that's that welfare system, uh, the government has been, become their God, but for me, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And we look, go back and we look at when this thing really exploded was, was through Lyndon Baines Johnson, who was one of the slickest, smartest politicians I've ever seen. 
when he came up and signed that civil rights bill. And he said, I'll have those N-words voting uh, Democrat for the next 200 years and it's almost come to fruition. And so uh, he put a condition in is that we will, will issue out welfare money to mothers, but the mothers have to be single parents and the, and the black man that cannot be there. So it, it, it disengaged him from his, his responsibility. And we're still dealing with that because now we have generations of people that are going from uh, on the welfare program. And so my dad, when uh, welfare was talked about, he wanted to know what is that? He said, it's gonna be by the, end of, by the end of my own hand because the best hand you can find is at the end of your own arm. And if we would begin to understand that if we would continue to compete rather than compare, we can change anything. Amen, amen. Uh, well, Mr. Anderson, um, there's a ton more things I would like to ask you, but I need to open it up because I know there's folks chomping at the bit that wanna chime in and ask you some questions. So I wanna open up the, uh, the forum to uh, Neil or Kevin. Uh, is there, if there's anything that you would like to um, ask of uh, Mr. Henderson uh, um, before I move on to uh, the next thing I wanted to ask him about. Yes, absolutely. Um, Mr. Anderson, uh, one of my questions, I had a couple of questions actually. The first one was, when you guys did the sit down, what was your end game? And what were you planning? What do you think the end game was going to be? And did it turn out what you thought it was going to turn out? Or did, you know, I'm just trying to understand the planning process to get there, you know, because that's very critical in our day. We may have to do something similar, as you've seen with the with the rights and restrictions being imposed, you know, taken away and imposed upon us. So, well, for me personally, I had no idea that it would become what it did become. And we pulled, we, we picked FW Woolworths for a specific reason. They were chain stores. And so we wanted, hopefully, that it would catch on with other stores. And it did all and down the southeastern area of the United States. As a matter of fact, uh, when the lunch counter was integrated in New York, they even participated in it. So our end game was to bring to the forefront of what was happening uh, in America at that particular point in time, as far as Black folks were concerned. And the whole idea was that we were going to remain peaceful no matter what, because we understood that we had the right to peaceably assemble. And as a matter of fact, they went to uh, it, it was a it was a president of uh, uh, a and at that time. Before now, it's, it's, it's chances, but anyway, uh, they went to him. The powers that be went to him, and uh, what they stated was that said to the, to the chancellor, the president, uh, we demand that you either suspend these kids or you uh, uh, expel them. And he very wisely said that as long as they go to class. And as long as they don't create any disturbance, what they do with their own time is up to them. It took 176 days. And so it was 176 days of people sitting down to stand up for freedom. It was 176 days of people crying, freedom over freedom over me. And before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. So on February 1st, uh, there was a shot that was fired, fired that was heard around the world. And we have changed the course of history by putting Jim Crow on trial. And Jim Crow was found guilty. So now you don't have any laws in the books right now when it comes to Jim Crow. It's just that the people have to catch up with. So my, my next question was, from what I understand, uh, long before any laws were passed, Woolworths realized that 10% of their income came from black folk. And this would be a terrible thing to their bottom line if all black folk boycotted that. So. It, it seems like they made a very wise commercial decision as well. And can you talk about how Blacks today can use that to their advantage without the violence, without, you know? You, have, you just brought up what is, I think, the key point to why integration was successful. Because it cost Woolworths and Greensboro and said some $200,000, which would be the equivalent today of uh, a million or $2 million. And so when uh, we caused them not to be able to carry on with their business, then uh, they understood because money is universal, everybody understands it. And so the same thing happened with Dr. King and those down there. When they stopped riding the bus, it had such a major economic impact that they were willing to uh, change and go another way. Uh, because even when George Wallace said, 
segregation now, uh, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, that thing just would not last uh, because of the economic impact that it had. And it would, seem, it would seem to me, I mean, again, I wasn't there, uh, but it would seem to me that that sort of change is actually far better because now you're going to a vendor who says, I need these people's business versus some guy in the government is forcing me to do this. It would seem to me that, you know, yeah, we definitely need the laws to protect our rights, but it seemed that that commercial forefront seems to be much more powerful and much more convincing, it would seem, in, in many ways. And of course, I'm thinking of Gandhi and, and what happened in India too, with our independence, right? It is because think of uh, 2020, when there was supposedly uh, uh, peaceful movements and was actually uh, rise, it was tearing down America. Right. So. They, taught, they were tearing America down and we were building America up. We were bridging the gap between the, the, the races and all the great things that have happened since then. And so now we need to uh, look at the difference about uh, what kind of difference that makes a peaceful movement versus a, 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 a non-peaceful movement uh, that helps build America up. And so we, just, uh, we want to bring to the forefront that we just sit down at the table and engage uh, and problems that we have in America. And that's how we begin to change things. So one last question. And, and this is, so I, um, my daughter and I wrote a book talking about EBLM and we talk about um, what the black communities were before LBJ destroyed them. And can you talk about what it was like going to black communities, where there were actually fathers in the home and where they were centered around the Bible and things like that. Can you give us some of a glimpse of that past of America, even while racism was around? Well, Lonnie touched on it a few minutes ago when he talked about uh, um, the uh, thriving communities we had because in that, in the, we had a lot of black businesses that were in the neighborhood and the money stayed in the neighborhood. Right. Uh, and now it doesn't even stay in the neighborhood over the weekend. It's gone, as a matter of fact, it's gone out, it's old out before we can receive our check. And so we had a lot of thriving businesses um, that uh, helped build the neighborhood up. Uh, in the neighborhood I was uh, first thing when I came to Greensboro, we had uh, dentists there. We, we had a dentist there. We had a, uh, an attorney there. There was a, 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 a service station owner. So anything we wanted, uh, that the that, that, uh, uh, community was self-contained and we learned how to interact with each other on a, uh, 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 the right kind of way. And uh, one of the things I saw, and as I think of these things, uh, I saw um, uh, uh, privilege or uh, entitlement when I was uh, all of uh, five or six years of age. My uh, father, my, my mother sent my middle brother and I to the store uh, to buy something that she was going to prepare for dinner. And there were three guys on the side of the street and uh, on the side of the road because it wasn't street then. Uh, and they I decided they were going to take the money from my brother. And they, I can remember like yesterday, these three guys had him swinging. And all of a sudden, he got loose on those guys and ran those guys off and uh, went on the store and got what we, uh, my mother sent him for. So we have people right now that... Um, uh, I think they entitled, uh, uh, look at entitlement. And, and when we really, again, I have to say this while I'm thinking about it. The government is the biggest welfare system in America. <laughs> and we need to understand that, is that they don't produce anything. They live off the taxpayers' money. And we keep going to them when they're supposed to be representing us because uh, uh, governments are in, 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 instituted among men they're arriving at just powers from the consent of the governed and not the government. Thank you, thank you. Beautiful, thank you. That's such an honor, by the way, really honored. Yeah, it's, thank you. It's, it's been incredible. Uh, another question. So you were the last, in that photo, in the Sicilian photo, you were the last one at the end on that counter? Yeah, I'm, I'm the last one, at, uh, 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 Kevin, and there's only one difference. Mm -hmm. My hair grows on the inside now rather than the outside. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was actually invited by a young man that was uh, part of the, the initial four that came um, on that first day, a guy by the name of Ezell Blair that I started out with him in the first grade and went all the way to a t together. 
And he call, came down to Bluford Library in the, in the basement of the library, which was a lounge, and told me what they'd done on the first day. And uh, that's how I got involved. Uh, and what happened was, was that uh, uh, they went back to recruit people in the campus, and I was one of the ones that uh, said I would participate. And, but here's the thing. Uh, I don't know if you remember before, I said that we had to be able to afford the meal. Had they served me, I could not have paid for a meal because I didn't, didn't have any money. But he okay. had told me that uh, if they served us, he would, he would pay for the meal because, see, those four, four guys stayed on campus. And I stayed off campus because my parents could not afford for me to live on campus. So I only found out about it on the second day. Uh, and I'm still fighting that fight now. <laughs> so another question, In, any of the Greensboro four still living or are they all passed on or? Well, other than guy, your the guy that you see, the first guy at the counter, Joseph McNeil, he lives in, uh, I think it's Hempstead, New York or somewhere like that. And he's L. Blair. Uh, uh, he is uh, still living. He, he lives up in the in the uh, Boston area, but the, the 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 two guy and the guy that's sitting right beside me, uh, he was a senior at that time. He's deceased now. So of the four original guys, uh, two of them are alive and two of them are deceased. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, one of the guys, the name of uh, uh, David Richmond. Uh, he decided to stay in Greensboro and he was ostracized. And I think that helped lead to his demise because he died when he was 49 years of age. Wow. wow. Okay. Do you see any um, parallels to today? I mean, we're, we're make, we, there's always big issues about racism and white supremacy and all of this. And it's really kind of, Re regurgitate or re revitalize over the past few years? Do you see, do we, comparatively speaking, do we actually have anything to compare or to complain about compared to back then when you were in that time? Is that, is that valid? Uh, yes, we do have some things to com compare uh, uh, a parallel uh, because uh, things like critical race theory, which is nothing but a theory, and that, that was the America then, that's not the America now, but they're trying to take us back to that time and keep us in the box that they've always tried to keep us in. And uh, they are now teaching uh, members of the white race, uh, uh, that, that, that teaching members of the black race to determine who they are, the way that they determine who we are during Jim Crow time, where they want, they want to teach our, our black kids to uh, judge the uh, white race by the color of their skin, not the content of their character. And, uh, you know, as far as um, comparing those things, yeah, I see some comparative things that, you know, as I said before, I grew up in the era of time of Jim Crow, and I never went to a black school, I mean, to a, uh, an integrated school. So one of the things I have is that first they wouldn't let us in, and now they won't let us out, which is detrimental to our kids as far as their education is concerned. So, the, the, it should, the, the school system should be competitive. It should go back to classical education where we teach the whole person according to how God made them spirit, soul, and body. And we're not doing that. And so that's a real challenge right now at this particular point in time. And worry about it, we had uh, um, marriages in the, in the black community were up somewhere around 73%, one of the highest rates when I was growing up of any, any, any race of people in America. But now, right now, 73% of our kids are born out of wedlock. As a matter of fact, in New York, for every black baby that's born, you got two that are aborted. And so we have either bought into, uh, uh, we've been sold into the idea that we are what somebody says we are. And reputation is what other people say you are, but character is what we are, and we need to understand that. Amen. All right. All right. Um, any other questions, Kevin? No, I'm good. Okay. Uh, about, how about you, Neil? I'm great. Thank you. I'm sure okay. I'll think of a whole bunch more later on. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can already see that. Hey, we're going to need to have another session, Kevin and, and, and Neil, to have and have Mr. Henderson come back because there's many other things I'm I'm, I'm thinking of that. Uh, we want to cover, but I'm looking yeah, at I mean, the time. Like, I'd like to talk about like what happened right afterwards, and then 
um, talk about, you know, the planning process of how you got there and things like that, you know, how, how old you were, how you got involved with the movement, things like that. All those things would be fascinating to know. I was 18. At, on when it happened. Mm -hmm. And then how yeah. did they, how did they like talk you into it? How did you, did you just know it was something you want to do or did somebody have to convince you it was something you had to do? I'm sure there were some, I, I know, you know, there was probably some issues that you had to consider. Do you remember my saying about, uh, I've been in Woolworths on a number of occasions and what I'd seen is, and also what I'd seen uh, growing up and living in that uh, integrated neighborhood, uh, the, the uh, white kids just come to my house and we play together and right. I had, a, had a huge, uh, huge, uh, uh, yard and I, matter of fact, I even built built my own basketball goal. We would go out there and play basketball, football, baseball, and we never had an argument. So I found out then that 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 uh, racism people are not born with it; right. they're indoctrinated into it right. because those kids' parents didn't know where they were, and so that was that was one of the things. Another thing is that when I was in the eleventh grade. Uh, my mother finally let me go to where a lot of other guys were going earlier than that. And I used to go to Wildwood, New Jersey and work uh, and buy clothes, uh, say in, in New Jersey, we didn't have in Greensboro. And so I can remember like it was yesterday, getting on the bus and having to stand up uh, from the time that we left, almost the time that we got there because it was, it was not because they were not in the seats on the bus, but they were not in the seats on the back of the bus. Right. And so I can remember nodding and uh, stand up nodding, and this guy just showed me off of him uh, because he was sitting in one of those very comfortable seats. Now, I, when I was standing up, it was an amazing thing. I, I, there were a lot of people standing up, and they stood all the way up to past the line of where the, uh, black and white. And so I was standing, I, I was able to stand at the front, but I couldn't sit at the front. I only could sit at the back. No, it's it's quite a, it's quite interesting because my parents came, so with, they were on their way to Jamaica in 1964, and they had to fly through New York, and somebody actually offered my my dad's a professor in physics and I actually offered him a position in the U.S. and they landed in New York and my mom said we're we're never coming to this country with the way they treat people here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just kind of, that was their impression. And then we, when we moved to Jamaica, so I, I was in Jamaica for three years as a kid uh, growing up there too. But it was just an interesting concept that to see what America was like back then, that even my mom would be like, hey, we're not going there. Well, Lonnie, going back to something you said before, I may not lie, but Kevin, oh, <clears throat> for the most part, what you hear, especially from the Democratic Party, is race this, racism that. But my question always, my response always to that is that if America's so racist, why are people dying to come here, but nobody's dying to leave? Even those people that, that, that have all the money to talk about America all the time. So somebody's lying somewhere. And so we have to understand that. Um, and one of, like, for example, one of the things I can remember is that uh, when I was growing up, uh, my mother had some relatives that lived in Philadelphia, New Jersey. And I can remember one summer going with my parents to, to uh, 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 well, Philadelphia. And my dad stopped at the White Castle uh, to go in and get some food. And I'm sitting there looking out the window when he's going toward the door. And I see the sign change from open to close. And I also see uh, they uh, close the blinds. So my father wouldn't let him in. So we had to go find some food some other place. So when I hear people talking about racism now and comparing it to what they said then is totally different because see uh you're never gonna get rid of racism whether it's uh, uh blacks or whites because it's a hard thing no law can be put on the books don't change that and i'd say that's the marked difference um, between now and what took place back then and uh experiencing uh how did how did you feel when you saw that um, uh -huh. it, it, you know, it's, it's one of the things, it's like when you get used to things, you're more readily uh, probably going to accept them. 
And so during that time, uh, uh, it was just a, a, it was a, it was a, an acceptable a accepted thing that we were to stay in our place. And um, so we went through that time. I uh, went through that, and that's what we usually did. Uh, except that uh, one of the things I found out is that when you look at movements, most of them are started by younger people. The old people sort of get set in their ways and they're apprehensive. They may lose their job or position or whatever. And so it was us that uh, decided we had had enough. And what caused that to happen was is that uh, the guy, at the, at the very first guy in the picture, uh, Joseph McNeil, is uh, from New York. And for about 11 years, this guy, uh -huh. by, the, guy by the name of... Uh, um, uh, Ralph John, who had a clothing store near uh, A&T, had been pushing the black guys because he sold clothes for for, guy, for men. Had been pushing uh, A&T students to get involved with something. He was a Syrian, and he had faced a lot of different things, Neil, like what you were talking about a few minutes ago. And uh, he was trying to get us to do something to change some things about uh, segregation. And so uh, Joe McNeil was one of the ones that says, yeah, we're gonna do something. And so when Joe McNeil came back from uh, uh, Christmas break, he stopped at the bus station in Greensboro. It was about two o'clock in the morning. And uh, he, it was a, there was a, a restaurant there. And so he went to be served and they wouldn't serve him. So that's when they went back and these four uh, original guys, they, uh, uh, there was two to a room. And so they, they had become friends through that. And they went back and decided that's when they were going to do something. Mm. Mm. So young people yes. rising up and wanting to push back uh, yeah. because they're, they're just foolish enough to believe God. <laughs> and say, Lonnie, one of the things that, and here's what we got to understand. Freedom is not free. Mm -hmm. There's a price that must be paid. It must be paid up front. And it's continual. We have to defend our sovereign rights as citizens uh, each and every day, because we see now where we have uh, these uh, uh, sovereign, what do you call it, sovereign cities where a person can commit a crime, uh, an illegal alien, and go there and not have any problems. But if you or I commit a crime and we go uh, overseas somewhere, if America has a working relationship, that they'll come and get us. So we've right. lost a lot of our sovereignty now at this time because we don't understand who we are as sovereign citizens of these United States. Mm. I would agree. I would agree, sir. Well, I'm looking at the time here, and um, I don't know much, how much time that you can share with us, but uh, if um, we've been about what about almost an hour now, um, I certainly want to thank you for coming on to. Uh, Lonnie, we have some questions from. Oh, the, we do. Okay. Yeah, we Great. do. Great. Well, we we'll, we'll hang on for those questions. Yes. Yeah, so uh, let me read one from uh, Joseph. He says, so I have found that like socialists who don't love the poor, but hate the rich, many on the left don't love the different people they claim to defend, they just hate norms. This hatred seems to stem from a whole lot of accrued resentment towards people they don't bother to understand. Do you think there is any way to diffuse that resentment and actually get people speaking together and acknowledging their mutual humanity again? Um, yes. The first thing is understand the difference between systemic racism and systemic corruption. Because uh, I can go all the way back to since I've uh, been born when I talked about the relationship that my father had with uh, uh, the guy that he worked for and they became very good friends. I can remember my brother uh, going and almost losing his life uh, in the Korean conflict uh, and coming back and still serving his country, uh, his city, by becoming a policeman. And I can uh, go back and look at, uh, even when we had the sit-in movement, there were a number of white students that did participate, not for long, but they did. So um, the, the, the government, if they would uh, stop putting laws in place then people would, would come to reconcile uh, uh, more than they do right now. And so the idea is that to show yourself friendly, and I've always shown myself friendly, and I don't think you find anywhere that I've been in a public forum 
and having a debate or whatever, uh, you hear me go down the uh, uh, road of being angry. My thing is to uh, uh, get my point across. And, and what we, what the best thing we can do right now is discuss the issues and not the person. Where we have council culture right now, that needs to be gotten rid of. It's like we're like animals. We cannot sit down and have a uh, reasonable conversation together. We not, may not agree, but that's okay. Uh, because uh, all ideas, we have freedom of speech. And so if we will allow the things to con continue, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to, to peacefully assemble, uh, those things will help resolve a lot of things. And stop making racism a number one priority. Amen. Thank you. Uh, second question from Stacy. Uh, she would like to know, in addition to the Bible, do you have any book recommendations, any books that have inspired you? Um, there's, there's books about uh, uh, like, uh, the uh, American economy and how it, how it works. Uh, I can't think of the name of a book uh, offhand, but uh, any book that teaches you to between making money and building wealth, there's a big difference. And I don't have time to go into all of it, except that uh, we need to understand the economic part and where you fit on that economic part. Uh, a lot of my heroes have been, I, I follow sports all my life, have been sports figures, how they have overcome and, uh, 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 and have been able to compete because uh, sports teach you about the value of life. It teaches you there's a time uh, that things start at a time that ends. And so what really got me peaked was uh, uh, the one of the things is uh, uh, black history, history, uh, well, history in black and white is by uh, Dave Barton. That's one of the things, uh, one of the books I, I uh, look at. And there's so many of them that I, that I read for understanding. And I'm one of those ones that America is uh, uh, all about the person that is able to overcome. And so any book about how people have overcome any kind of adversity to uh, uh, be able to live out, the, have the opportunity to live out the American dream, those are the kinds of things that I read. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have one more question and to our attendees, if you have a question, now's the time to get it in the Q and A. Um, so this is from Kimberly. She says, evening Clarence, we talked about American opportunity in regards to economic development. Would you say we had equal opportunity in regards to Black Wall Streets, i.e. Tulsa and Rosewood? Do you think that those communities worked, um, worked writhing, worked with, I think she meant work within the confines of the Jim Crow economic system in America. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, well, one of the things that we all had to recognize is that slavery was horrific. And one step above that was, uh, uh, was uh, Jim Crow. But when you learn to compete rather than compare, it changes things. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, once we grab a hold of that, uh, everybody does not uh, stay in the same place. We need to know, and does not start the same place. We need to know, uh, uh, one of the things that I, I, I live by is what the first, the second sentence in the Constitution in the Declaration of Independence says, that we're all created equal, and that's been ordained by God. And so I find that more times than not, uh, everybody that I uh, come in contact with they're very friendly. They speak, uh, socialize. And so it, it, it's what you bring to the table. It's the fact that you uh, uh, make yourself attractable uh, from the standpoint of being able to engage in any kind of conversation. So we have, and, and what's happening right now is that I see so many people spending time on Facebook and, and, and on Twitter, uh, putting out all these, these, these nasty tweets and all these kind of things. So, uh, the thing that we need to, what's so important is that also is that we, uh, when we uh, vote for people, we need, to, we need, to, we need to, to vet them to make sure that we're putting the right people in because see, uh, uh, America usually follows a leadership. And so when you see uh, people that are working for the country, 
as opposed to against the country. Then that gives us hope. And so we have to make sure that our system works. If the system doesn't work, then we need to get rid of it. Uh, and what's happening right now is that there's so many people that don't understand the difference between socialism and, uh, uh, and capitalism. And, and when you don't understand that, it's like putting a square peg in a round hole, it just won't work. Okay. Well, we don't have any more questions from the audience. So Lonnie, I turn it back over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Regina. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Henderson, uh, powerful statements uh, that you made. And uh, I'm taking notes here, things I wanna ask you the next time I talk to you. Uh, um, um, and, and we can cover more topics. Uh, truly an honor and a pleasure to have you on the uh, on our program today. And um, well, you know, I want to ask you: is um, is there a book in the works? Uh, it's funny that you say that. Yeah, <laughs> my my wife is editing it now uh, by the guy that uh, wrote it, uh, and it should be coming out sometimes in the next couple of months. Okay. Uh, not only that, it's an autobiography of my life. Not only that, but there's a movie scheduled to come out also, which I hopefully will help unify this country to make us understand that Dr. King said, unless we learn to live together, brothers, we'll perish together as fools. And also what the Bible says, God says, my people are perishing from the lack of knowledge. How can we go into battle side by side, no matter what race, and fight that battle to win the battle, and yet come back here and get caught up in these things that are supposedly peaceful things. So when we, uh, when I, when, when I, the book will hopefully show people that America is the greatest opportunity there is. And I see America, I'm an optimist. I see the American opportunity, I see the glass half full as opposed to half empty. Yes. And the glass half full represents the American opportunity. All you have to do is pour yourself over into that glass and whatever comes out belongs to you. And so the, the greatest country in the world where every, with the light that shines upon a hill, the reflective light of God himself, and yet we do not understand why all these people are coming here for the opportunity. We just understood that we could change America basically overnight. Amen. Amen. I'm reminded of uh, one of the quotes from my dear old dad who, uh, in his direct way, say, well, son, uh, uh, America might have warts, but there's still no place, better place in the world to be. And that's why everybody's <laughs> trying to get here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So I'll take America warts and all. <laughs> over Amen. America. All righty. As Don well, King you. said, only in America. Yeah, yeah, only in America. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, this will conclude um, the program for this evening. For those of you listening um, and watching in, thank you so much. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, um, this fascinating gentleman, um, you can just Google him. He'll come up and um, <laughs> learn more. And we've got some things planned um, on your behalf as well. I don't want to steal uh, thunder away from Kevin and his uh, Neil, but um, you guys will be hearing a lot more of uh uh, Clarence Henderson and, and the wonderful work he does. And, and also uh, he mentioned he's chapter president of the Frederick Douglass Foundation of California, whereas uh, Kevin is the chapter president of the Frederick Doug Douglass Foundation of uh, California. So there is a, uh, there's a link uh, and a connection there between the two. So again, thank you all so much for joining us and this will conclude uh, the program. Well, I thank you for you guys for the opportunity to engage. You're very well. You, you all have a blessed evening. All righty, yes. take care. Thank you again, sir. Yeah, God bless you. Thank you, Clarence. We'll talk to you later. Appreciate Bye now. Right.